<laughs> mm. Jerry Heine is amazing. <laughs> He's the rabbit in the Energizer commercial. He just keeps going and going and bringing and bringing kingdom everywhere he goes. Jerry's amazing. Let's, uh, I want to go ahead and start this with a video we're going to play right now. Isaac, let's go ahead and play that real quick. Let's make sure we kill these lights so it doesn't fade it out too much. Hopefully you could see and read all of that. How many was able to read? Could you read most of that? 
Man, today we're going to talk about gratitude and thanksgiving. <laughs> this is flood 50 week here at Lifehouse, and it's a time to celebrate <laughs> the goodness of God in each and every one of our lives. The goodness of God flourishes, whether we see it or can see it or not, you know. Um, me, myself, personally, I grew up with a little bit of a negative streak in me without ever knowing it until God started putting me. <laughs> put me in the journey and a place and an amazing wife in my life to help start seeing and recognizing at times my mouth and thoughts tend towards the negative more than the positive, tend towards the lack rather than the abundance that is always there in our life. And uh, so this is, <laughs> this is a life I say, it's also a very personal thing to me, um, this journey that I really feel it's for the rest of my life because, you know, the scripture says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His goodness never ceases. The abundance in the kingdom of heaven never ends. Like it's, it's hard for us to grasp that. So today, I want to talk about the foundations for a life of thanksgiving. So what is the difference between gratitude and thanksgiving? I ask myself. Maybe you've thought this too. The difference is gratitude really, to boil it all down, gratitude is a heart condition the ability to have gratitude of heart. Thanksgiving is the expression of that heart of gratitude. The ability to say thank you, and that's its simplest form. The ability to give in abundance comes from a place of having a heart of gratitude. Now, we, were just, we just watched this video, and you could argue that she, in order for her to pen that song that I personally grew up in the church when I was a little kid, I remember seeing, singing that song in worship. Not ever knowing the story behind it, that it came from a place of tragedy. <laughs> it didn't come from a place of someone living, winning the lottery. You know? It came really from the worst thing that could happen to a family, a mom or dad passing, you know? <laughs> uh, Mother Teresa once was approached by a man, and he asked for prayer. And she said, well, what would you want me to pray for you about? And he asked that she would pray for him to gain more understanding. And her response was, I, I can't pray that for you. Because God's never asked us to have understanding, but he's always asked us to trust. Amen. The ability to trust. And that's, <laughs> that's amazing about that song. Oh, for grace to trust him more. That to me speaks of where the fountain is. There's times in our life that we can't trust within ourselves to have that ability to trust, to have the ability to hope, to have the ability to dream, to have the ability to have joy, faith, long-suffering, Peace, the, bount the endless supply comes from Jesus Christ. He is the giver of all these things, and that never ends. It's as deep as the deepest oceans. It's as deep as the furthest parts of the universe. The fountain, the endless supply is in Christ. Did you know it's okay for you? In fact, he, he strongly urges you to ask for his peace, for his grace. And for some reason, we think that we have to drum this up within ourselves. And it's a lie, I believe, from the pit of, enemy, from the pit of hell because, because he knows that that is our inheritance. And the enemy is all about stealing our inheritance. Our, our inheritance is Jesus' peace, his joy, his grace. God, give me more love for my neighbor. You know? 
So, hope, hope, hope. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is really the foundation, just to tell you, speak into my little journey, to have the ability to hope for change within my own life and how I thought and how I lived ever since I was a young age. And that was learning to trust more in him, to, to, for him to transform my mind, the renewing of my mind. We all know the scripture. Be transformed by the renewing of mind, Romans 12, through, 1 through 2. That's easier said than done. It's a journey. But the point is, is having him transform our mind and us in obedience going low and allowing him to transform our lives and tapping into his hope and to his grace, to his long-suffering. Our process that we go through in life can make us stronger or it can make us weaker. And the ability to receive and grow through those processes is completely dependent on how we've conditioned our hearts and mind. Our ability to receive and grow through the good and hard times are in direct proportion to the level of trust that we have in Christ. I want to read that one more time. Our ability to receive and grow through the good and hard times are in direct proportion to the level of trust we have in Christ. We heard a testimony right here this morning where she specifically stated, I prayed for something and I was disappointed because he didn't give it to me as I thought it would be. But in the end, she got more than she ever prayed for. That's the kingdom of heaven. You know the kingdom of heaven has bigger dreams for you than you have in yourself. And it's not about finances. That's a, that's a big trip up that we get caught up in, the whole financial thing. Your dreams will happen whether you have the finances or not because it comes from a place of obedience is what gives it the birth to that. Us walking into obedience will in turn engage kingdom finances for that thing to happen. But we must steward the things he gives us, whether it's from the very beginning of nothing to where you're living in the mansion. It's the both are the same. Both cases, you have to steward well because he's given you a gift in your life. It has nothing to do with finances. It has to do with stewarding the gifts of heaven that God brings to us. So often or not, you know, in my life, I get caught up in lack, the, the mindset of lack. You know, in my dreams, I could, if, if I only had this, I would be able to do this. And what I found in my life, that if I would just act upon what I have in that moment and be thankful for that, see what's in my hands, and give everything I can to that from that place, provision will come. Because I'm walking in obedience. It's always about obedience. Mm. So a heart of thanksgiving is nourishment for a heart of praise. This house is called, every house in the world, including this house that stands before you right now, is called to a high level of praise, right? Well, thanksgiving is a nourishment. It nourishes the heart of praise. Because the thing about praise is that you're, when you praise something, it's because you saw its substantial goodness in that. That's why you're praising it. If we're blind and we're always grumbling and complaining, we are setting the mood of our heart to not be able to see the good in any situation. Mm -mm. We as a family are called to a high level of praise. Grumbling and complaining is nourishment for the heart of destruction. It's the opposite. It does the exact opposite. One of the things I put in here is, um, these are notes from over the years that God's been putting on this journey of mine. It's love child is selfishness. The thing that grumbling, complaining produces is selfishness. Inevitably, you get into the mode about getting mine and putting everyone else down around you. You get into the comparison game. Well, they've got this. I don't have that. They were promoted. I wasn't. It's looking at, you start looking at all the lack in your life instead of looking at the abundance that God has brought in your life. When we grumble and complain, we're losing the order of where God stands and where we stand. 
Trusting in Jesus is one of our greatest callings. Answering that call is the key into knowing more of who he is. And truly believing the scripture of Isaiah 55 that his ways are higher than mine. Again, it's not, under, it's not about understanding. It's like, God, man, you know, I did this and it totally didn't turn out how I thought it would. And getting to that place of trusting, well, then he must have something better. The ability to say, well, he must have something better. You know what I mean? But so often we get stuck in the moment of concentrating on how it didn't happen, how we think it, we thought it would happen, you know? And it stifles us. It stifles our creativity. It stifles our worship that we're called to release. Mm. What praise and worship to God is what grumbling and complaining is to Satan. The argument can be made that you all read the story of Lucifer falling from heaven, right? He was grumbling and complaining. He's, he's completely, he's the most beautiful creature in heaven, adorned with all the beauty of heaven. And he comes before the throne saying, I sh- but I should have that. That should be my seat right there. He's still looking from a place of lack through a heart of ungratefulness. And we go to Adam and Eve. What happens? They've got everything. They are walking in the garden with the God of creation and talking with him daily, communing and abiding with him. But even in that place of abiding, they start looking at lack of what they think they should have rather than looking at the abundance that God already brought. It's really kind of our human condition now in a lot of ways. That one battle, and believe it or not, that one little battle, whatever we decide, vastly changes our direction in life and how we see the world and the decisions that we make. But we see it all through the Bible of people, including Paul, no matter what the circumstances would come, would choose the higher road. But there's a blessing and thankfulness. And even with Paul, there was a blessing in telling his story. There's so many stories in here where y'all have chosen to look at the abundance of Christ in your life. And that's called your testimony. And a lot of your testimonies in here came from a place of what the world would probably say was destruction. The, the world would probably say it was broken. So how could we get a testimony from a place of brokenness? You know, you ever think of that? If you think about your testimony, everyone in here right now could think about your testimony, and the world would say, no, that was a broken situation. We've all heard Willie's testimony. He's a perfect example of a man and a family rising to proclaim the goodness of God because of a beautiful woman he created and brought to earth. And they celebrate that. That's the ability, that that ability happened because of a preparation of a heart of gratitude. And when it all hit the fan, It exposed it. Meditating on what God has done in our lives is a propellant for the growth of a heart of thankfulness. When we release our heart of thankfulness, we release the heart of praise. There's an old song. Thank God you get a drink of water if I'm going to do this right. How many ever heard of Andre Crouch? That's a shame. Only half the room raised their hands. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah, Australia. <laughs> yes. Well, this album, Under Crouch and Disciples, 
look it up. It's on you. It's on uh, iTunes, believe it or not. It's from '73, but there's a song they sing. Somebody told me of the joy they had, and somebody told me that in sorrow they could be glad, and then they told me. Once they were bound, but now set free. But I didn't think it could be until it happened to me. But now I could tell you of the joy I have. And now I could tell you that in sorrow I can be glad. And now I could tell you once I was bound, but now set free. But you'll never know that it's true until it happens to you. Everyone in here, you have that story to tell. I guarantee everyone in here, it's happened to you. You have the ability to speak of the goodness of God and for the world to hear because it happens to you. It's, it's a matter of whether you can see it or not. It's whether you're your mind's eye of thankfulness is able to see the goodness of God, his finger through your life. I watched a video the other day of an interview of Betty Chen. How many of you saw that video? It was on the outpost here in town. Phenomenal woman. And yeah, her story's crazy. And, but everything she does, you can just see thankfulness permeating from her life and in everything she does she does to the fullest everything that's given to her you can tell she stewards life really well because the smallest thing she makes beautiful for others all around her and it's an amazing story betty chin and she's changing the county because i think she walks through life with a heart of gratitude and as things come along her path, she's able, she's able to release it to others. I don't hear her when I hear her talk at different times at her interviews. She doesn't talk about lack. She doesn't talk about what she doesn't have or what the people. She talks about trying to figure out how to get to people who, who need help. It's not about her. It's about helping others around her. And that's her focus. And that's really what we're called to do as a church family is in what we saw here today. You know, um, um, Dwayne Hagens saw a need in, in, in this city. And he helped, he helped someone in, in our church family. Just a basic, we want to work on your house. And... Instead of like, oh, we don't have this to do it, we don't have that to do it, so we'll let the dream die until it you know, appears. He made it happen in order for someone to be blessed beyond the expectations that she had. And that's what we're all called to do, is come from that place of thanksgiving. You know, Paul and Silas in jail, we all heard the story. They're in jail, and what do they end up doing? They start worshiping, right? They start praising God. And as they're praising God, there's an earthquake. The jail doors are broken free. Their chains are broken off. And the jailer, because back in the day, if the, if the uh, jailer who's watching the inmates escape, well, he has to pay for whatever their sentence was. In his, this case, he was going to die. And that's why he was going to kill himself when he saw the doors, prison doors were flung open. He's, he's like, I'm good as dead. But of course, that wasn't the point for Paul and Silas. Their heart was ministering. Their, them releasing praise in that jail was changing the atmosphere. Their first thought wasn't to run. Their, 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 their first thought was to, to praise Jesus in the midst of, you know, horrible circumstances. And I really believe there's the symbolism in that story is exactly what thankfulness does, is that it really does break the chains open for others to see. When we start praising in the worst circumstances, the world around hears and listens and their chains are broken, and I believe we give them the ability to also see the goodness of God. Mm. I 
There's amazing, amazing stories of the goodness of God in this house. And there's amazing hearts in here that I believe are full of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, through 26. But the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And let us not become boastful, challenging one another, and envying one another. You know, I saw someone today, um, he's here every Sunday. And it totally, he just, the Lord, you know, I was going to say the scripture today. And the Lord was like, that's, he's part of those people that carry this, the gifts of the Spirit. Is Mike Owen still around? Where's Mike? Mike Owen in the back. Dude. Man, you're not just faithful, but you carry the joy of the Lord as you do the work of the Lord that he's placed in your heart to do. Like, I don't know if you know this, but you're changing. (laughs) You change the atmospheres even on Sunday morning as you walk around doing, you know, the task that, that is on your heart to do out of faithfulness. The joy of your heart is, is changing the atmosphere as you're moving around this, this house and amongst this family. And I hope you know that. And I hope you know that there's such a blessing on your life, the ability to carry that. And it's infectious. Yeah. So we just, we just pray over Mike, God, and we thank you, God. And we, we just speak... Man, the blessings of heaven upon him of, of being able to see, the ability to see more of your goodness. Father, for all the years of faithfulness that he's carried for this church family, God, we just speak blessings upon him. And we thank, we're thankful for Mike Owen. This house is thankful for Mike Owen, Lord. And this county is thankful for Mike Owen, Lord. Yeah. There's so many of you in here, this church family, you know, We talk a lot about changing the culture of Humboldt County. It's part of our, what do you call it? The three mandates. This culture shift. One of the biggest ways we're going to shift the culture of Humboldt County is it's not, through fine, it's not through money. Money doesn't shift things when people are broken. Mindsets, mindset shifts is what changes cultures. The belief system of where people are at changes cultures. And I believe the body of Christ in Humboldt County walking the fullness of the, 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 in the fullness of the fruits of the Spirit is what's truly going to change Humboldt County. Walking in the fullness of joy, walking in the fullness of love, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of faithfulness, of gentleness, and of self-control are major keys to shifting cultures. Because usually when a culture is tanking, it's anemic in almost all of these within its culture itself. Uh, Just yesterday, ambulances flying by our house I mean, flying to where we told Josiah to get in the house because ambulance and police were just flying by our house. Right up the street on Emerald Lane, Rafars on Shamrock, um, two deaths happened. Not sure exactly what happened, but it wasn't good what's happened. Um, Immediately just got us, we started praying, like, whatever in that situation. and And then all through the day, constantly in Humboldt County, I was seeing death keep happening. It was like three times, four with these two gentlemen that were in the garage. And in almost every situation, I just felt the Holy Spirit. It's like, pray my fruit upon this land. Pray my fruit into this land. Part of the land is me, my my heart, because it's the soil. I'm the soil, right? We're all the soil, and we're all should be full and well ready 
to produce amazing fruit through the seeds that he plants in our life. And it all comes from the fruit of the Spirit, which comes from where? The ultimate supplier, Jesus Christ. It comes from him. And I want to encourage you all to make, start making that your prayer. All things come from him. He is our source. Christ is our source for everything. If you're struggling from that place that you feel that you have like that negativity lying in your life from being able to see the goodness of God, start praying, God, give me your eyes to see. Give me the fruit to expand upon to the world around me. In John 14, 27, he says, I'll leave you peace. It's my own peace I give you. I give you peace in a different way than the world does. So don't be troubled. I got to encourage you this morning. Ask. Ask for his peace. If you're having a problem loving, ask for his love to love. If you have a problem with hoping, ask for his hope to hope. There's that scripture in Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. Did you know that was actually penned for the church? Even though over the years, I know growing up, that was the big salvation thing to the lost. Jesus standing at the door and knock, you had to answer him to come into your life. And da, 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 you know? The thing is, is that so often when we come to Christ, especially as believers at the beginning, or even when we're old, we ask him to come on our property per se, but we never ask him to fully come into the house, which is the reason why that scripture, he's standing at that door knocking, hey, I'm on your property, thanks for letting me on your property, you know, no, no guns ablazing yet, shooting, tell me to get off the property, but you still haven't opened your front door. And I, I feel like that's, that's what God in, in Humboldt County with the church, our church specifically of Lifehouse, is that there's new levels he's calling us to. There's new levels that he's calling us to carry hope, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience. He's calling us to new levels of producing fruit in this county, in other words. And there's areas that even in the last few weeks, he's like, let me in that room. Let me in this room. Let me, let me into that part of your life. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Every one of you should never have to look to the person next to you and feel less than or feel lack. Within each and every one of us, there's the fullness of heaven that is waiting to be released as long as we see and allow it to be released. But we must first know what's in our hands. What has he put in your hands? What are you carrying in your life? The fact that he breathed the precious breath of God into your life. You know, in the Bible, I believe it was four times. It happens in uh, Genesis, I think it's in Isaiah, it happens with Jesus before the apostles when he commissions them. It says that he breathes in his face. And it happens, one of the last things in Revelation, it talks about him breathing into the church. Constantly, to me, it speaks so much of not only giving life, but it's, it's, also, it's also making intimate connection with his people. And from that place, the intimate connection, man, that's our inheritance. We get to live and draw from every day of our life. He's breathed his life into you. You are never without lack, even though we may feel like it at points in life. But when we come from that place of trust and knowing all things, if we truly believe that he makes all things happen for the good, that's the depth of trust that we're called to go to really believe that. And from that place to live a life of thankfulness and a heart of gratitude and carrying a heart of gratitude. So flood fifty, God put this in my heart. I was reading this bio or it's a book, not Bible, it's not a Bible. This a guy wrote this. Richard J. Foster, Celebration of Discipline, a few years back. 
Um, when I was at Bible college years ago, I read it, and it's always stuck with me. A great book. Again, it's called Celebration of Discipline. Um, I really encourage you to read this if you can. Get a hold of it. I started reading in here. He talked about, uh, he started talking about the different celebrations that it's really important that we grab a hold of us as believers. It's okay for us to party. It's okay for us to celebrate all the goodness of God. And we've kind of lost that in, our tr- in the culture, the church culture in the modern times. That we've lost the ability to want to celebrate and party together. Of course, when I say that, everybody's like, you know, you know, are you talking alcohol, cocaine? What are you talking about? You know, no, that's not what I'm talking about. We're not in the 70s here. It's not, it's not Studio 51 or whatever that was called. The built, you know, the Old Testament is so many, it's just so many celebrations, uh, festivals in the Old Testament. The Jews, the, Jew, the, Jew, the Jewish culture really got the ability to see the goodness of God and then turn around and celebrate it as a people. It's actually a really beautiful thing. To this day, they do these celebrations in their homes. There's different cultures that really get it. You go to uh, Africa. I've never been there. I've only seen video. In worship, man, it is like a full-on rock fest. And from what I've been told, it sounds horrible half the time. You know, most people aren't singing on tune, and people are clapping off rhythm or whatnot. But there's such a release of celebration that it's infectious because of the goodness of God that is being seen and praised in the midst of the believers of that church family. I don't know, is is India similar like that? (laughs) No? They're all over the place, all right. Kind of like, I guess we're all over the place. But I was reading this book, and he's talking about us getting back as a people to the ability to celebrate the goodness of God. And I really started, did you know that, uh, I might have lost it here. Um, There was back in, let's see if I can find it. It was back in the 1800s, I think in Europe, Man, I can't remember what they called it. They did a festival. Someone came up with a festival, and it was a big deal, apparently, that they, uh, they, would, they would celebrate in uh, making fun of their culture. The whole, the whole festival was about making fun of their culture. To the point, like, I, I guess it was okay. No one got offended. May, may, well, it's not going on anymore. Maybe someone got offended. <laughs> They would, they would bring, it was like a whole fun thing. They would bring like the governor out of the city and, you know, the different uh, bosses of different, you know, their bosses out and make fun of each other and their nuances. That was the whole festival was making fun of their culture. Now, I wouldn't propagate that, but I thought that was interesting, a creative way to start a festival. But if people are coming up with that, I mean, that's ridiculous. Making fun of each other, that's the festival? All right. I think those are called roasts these days. Yeah. <laughs> they get pretty nasty, too. And it got me thinking. It's like, we should start developing festivals. And what greater festival to start with than a festival of Thanksgiving? Of, of believers coming together to concentrate and to highlight every six months and celebrate the goodness of God in our life. That's the whole point of us being able to release. And now I want to say this because festivals are supposed to grow. Every year is supposed to more, there's more. And I really feel that here. And I want to say this. You're part of this church family. If there's something that you think should be at this festival, that has to do with thanksgiving and releasing a heart of praise and gratitude, bring it. it. It's never meant to be about a band, even though right now that's a big part of it, is that musicians are playing for 50 hours straight 
in worship, and every hour and a half, a new band comes in. We got we got bands coming in from um, the state of Washington. There's a couple of bands coming. Uh, Lake County, uh, there's a band coming from Lake County to play at it. But it's never meant to be a band thing. It's supposed to be a releasing and celebrating the goodness of God thing. And I, I want to invite y'all if there's something in your heart that you think this would be great as a, in a festival atmosphere to do, I really encourage you to bring that and do that. The whole point was to start changing our culture and how we think. And every six months, celebrate and concentrate on the goodness of God through thanksgiving and through praise. For years and years and years, this house has been releasing new levels of praise and worship. I got affected by it when I lived in Cottage Grove, Oregon, before I ever moved here, Kim and I ever moved here. Uh, we came down in 97, and the worship in this house was just, the, the anointing in this house during worship was so thick. It changed my life. I've been to a lot of worship conferences, big bands, big stage, big lights, some even with smoke. <laughs> Man-made smoke, not, you know. And, and I could truly trace back to where a shift happened in my life in the biggest way ever in this room. And it was, a God, it was a God moment. It wasn't a man moment, even though man was releasing their heart. It was a God moment, an encounter I had in this room. And there's, more, there's so much more to come that I, from this house, from the life house, humble family that I know God has in store. But I feel like, like I was talking at the beginning, I feel like we're a people standing there <laughs> with a seed in our hand. And all he's asking is, will you, will you steward this? And that's all I feel like we, we need to do. It's not a striving thing. It's a steward what he's put in our hand thing, that, that seed. It going beyond there is up to him, but us stewarding what we have now, what's in our hands, is of vital importance for the generations, because this isn't about, this isn't just about us. This is generations. This is generations that's, that's called to change Humboldt County forever. Not for a season, but forever. For Humboldt County to be full of love. For, for the crimes of anger and rage to dissipate. Because the fruits of the Spirit is being evident in each of our lives. Because Jesus is our source. I wanna leave, I wanna leave with just a little bit of tools today. To truly bring a culture shift, gratitude can also have a social benefit which brings that change. This is not a believer, what I'm about to read you. This is a doctor, a professor of psychology at the University of California, Davis, and a pioneer, get this, in gratitude research. <laughs> I don't even know. It. It's probably got millions of dollars from the government. To That's amazing. All I had to do is read the Bible. People who were assigned the task of making a daily gratitude list were more likely to report having helped someone with a personal problem or having offered emotional support to another, which obviously you, what you focus on is what you're going to produce, right? Relative to those who focused on the hassles of life or comparing themselves to others. And this is this, is this guy, Dr. Fro. <laughs> I know, could it write itself any better? How do we change from our negative habits to that of feeling more regular gratitude? Here is a list from Dr. Fro. 
which I think is it's a healthy it's a healthy list that we can all do, or and grab one and make it part of yours to cultivate the heart of gratitude and thanksgiving in your life. One is to keep a gratitude journal. Document daily what you feel grateful about. Document daily what God has done for you. Even in the smallest of things. (laughs) Two, get a gratitude buddy. Willie, will you be my gratitude buddy? (laughs) Oh my gosh. And talk about what you're grateful for with your buddy. Your buddy can help you make sure you acknowledge where your joy comes from. That is awesome. The difference between bragging and feeling grateful. I, they didn't say this. The difference between bragging and feeling grateful, the ability to say where the source came from. Isn't that good? The source for all comes from Christ. He is our source. Pay a gratitude visit to someone who has helped you in the past or write them a letter. Pause mindfully during the day to when something happens that you feel grateful about. Make a mental note. Watch your language I had, asked for G- I had asked forgiveness last night because I sat and listened to someone and didn't shut them down over crap they're spewing. I did. I had asked forgiveness on the way on a drive home. It's like I shouldn't have allowed that to enter my ears. Watch your language, even when talking to yourself. Be mindful of when you are focusing on the negative. Savor the good times with family and friends, photos, drawings, written accounts, and verbally acknowledging and appreciating people and events keeps you focused on the things you feel grateful for. Man, use, use a thing like Facebook to be a place to propagate the goodness of God, not spewing the negative you think about everything, you know? Whether it's, yeah, forget about political, what, no matter what it is. You know, use it as a tool for good, of hope, of fruit. Even those places can be a place of fruit that you can affect the world with. Mm. Yeah. So we just invite you. This Friday night starts at 6 o'clock, Flood 50. And it goes for 50 hours. And then the last time we have our last service at 6 o'clock, that goes till it ends on uh, that Sunday night. And this is all happening next weekend. And I really invite this house. If you're part of this church family, please come experience, release your heart. There's going to be booths. There's going to be a booth of, uh, that will have communion. There will be a booth of thankfulness. Um, there's a prophetic booth. There's many different areas where you, you'll be able to interact with with your own heart and releasing that. Yeah. What's your name? You have a coat, a coat on, nice coat on because it's been cold. What is your name? Laureen. Laureen. Yeah. I just, man, there's just a peace of God that he's just resting upon you. <laughs> And I feel like Jesus wants to know what he sees, he knows. <laughs> and he doesn't forget, he hasn't forgotten. And there's such a peace that the Holy Spirit is resting upon you to be able to just breathe and know that he is good. Yeah. Laureen, that's a beautiful name. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm so thankful. I don't get to speak much, but I'm so thankful that I got to be here today with y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I got I got one more. I got one more. What what's your name? What's your name in the back? You got a beard? <laughs> what's what's your name? Chris. Are you from around here? Yeah, yeah. Chris, I just feel like you are just a strong tower to, to uh, the family that's around you. And uh, 
you may not know this, but man, you, you carry so much hope and your words carry so much weight in that that uh, heaven, all of heaven is watching what you do with that hope. And no matter where you go, whether it's in work or amongst this people here or that people there, it's just being released and it's shifting the atmosphere with what you carry in your heart. And I feel like you've stewarded that a lot in your life. You've had a fight for it at times in your life. And that's, there's just an abundance that the Lord is bringing you, both not only in, in, um, in how you think, but what's produ- what is being produced around you. There's an abundance that God is bringing to you because of how you steward what's in your heart. You're, you're safe. You're a safe person. And you've stewarded that and protect that well. Yeah, you're such a blessing, Chris. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, God, I just thank you for today. And I just ask, God, that you'll just release once again just the ability and power of each and every one of us to tap into the source. That's you, Lord. The ability to have that fullness of joy. And even today, today, that there's a shift of no longer comparing. (laughs) No longer comparing right now, Father. I pray that you'll just cut off the comparison disease. And, And, Father, that the ability keen eyesight to look within and see the goodness that you have placed in each life here today and what you've placed in their hands. And I just speak a complete blessing over that in their life, Lord, that what you've given comes to the fullest, that seed in each and every one of us becomes the biggest high tower tree that could possibly grow and produce the most beautiful, healthy fruit that it could possibly grow, Lord. Because we want to mirror you and what you did, Jesus. Yeah. And we just thank you for what you have given. In your name, Lord. Amen. Yeah. Thank you all.